talk about what the immune system is, and then we can talk about the various components of the immune system. So when we begin, the immune system is a way for our body to protect ourselves, defend ourselves from invading pathogens, and also to create a memory in case we get attacked again from these invading pathogens. So the immune system is a great way for us to basically respond to anything that shouldn't be there and to create a memory against it. So when we look at the immune system, you can divide it into two major subcategories. You've got something called the innate immune system and you've got something called the adaptive. So these are the first two subdivisions. Now if you have any questions at all, just pop it through. The innate immune system is what it sounds like. This immune system is this division of the immune system is non-specific. So it doesn't really care what sort of pathogen is attacking you. It could be a bacteria, it could be a virus, it could be a fungi, for example. All right? So innate, let's write some important points, is non-specific. The other thing about the innate immune system is it does not develop a memory. Now when I say memory, what we're talking about here is the type of memory you develop once you get infected by a particular pathogen and that pathogen tries to infect you again, you fight it off quickly. So often, things like hepatitis for example, some types of influenza, you can get infected, you get sick, you develop antibodies, which is the memory, part of this adaptive phase, and then if you get infected by the exact same pathogen again, you don't get sick because you've developed your immune response to be able to attack it and kill it off before it does any harm to you. So the innate division of the immune system has no memory. It doesn't do that, okay? So it's non-specific, it has no memory, and it's the first defense, first line of defense. All right, so these are the three first important points for the innate immune system. Now, when we look at the innate immune system, there's a couple of subdivisions we need to look at. First of which is skin and mucus. Basically, when we talk about being invaded by viruses, bacteria, fungi, they're usually coming from, or all the time, they're coming from outside of the body. If they're coming from outside of the body, they're trying to get into the body. And a lot of the time, if it's a virus, it wants to hijack our cells and our DNA to make more copies of itself. If it's a bacteria, it wants to use our environment to make more copies of itself. And the same goes with a fungi as well. So we need to try and stop it from getting in. And so our first line of defense, our first barrier is our skin and our mucus lining. So for example, you know already that your skin is made up of stratified squamous epithelia. Now, squamous means squished, stratified means many layers. You did this in your assignment, right? So, stratified squamous epithelia. This skin barrier is so important because when this, let's just say bacteria, for example, tries to invade you, it's going to come into contact with many layers like a brick wall that's going to be hard to penetrate. In, a different to the, in, a, in addition to this, I should say, let me get another pen. In addition to this, so... Stratified squamous epithelia, right? In addition to that, we have particular glands that secrete substances like sebum. Now, sebum comes from sebaceous glands and it's like an oil substance. And this oil substance actually contains enzymes that kill off bacteria. So you can write sebaceous fluid. We also have enzymes, so let's write that down. Enzymes on our skin and in our mucus. And these enzymes include things like defensins, which sounds like exactly what it does. It defends us. They break down bacterial walls. Now, if we look at mucus, do we have a question? Uh, is this uh, like the cilia within the respiratory tract? Good question, Jade. So, if some of you did the respiratory tract for your assignment, you would have found that in the respiratory tract, it's not stratified squamous, but it's pseudo-stratified 
columnar epithelia. All right. That's because columnar cells secrete mucus most of the time. And the mucus it secretes is sticky. That's why we're looking at, so let's just say this pathogen, so remember, I probably should define this term. A pathogen is basically a foreign substance that's trying to invade your body. That's a pathogen. So a virus, bacteria, fungi, they can be pathogens, right? So let's just say pathogens not getting through the skin, but you inhale it either through your nose or through your mouth or you swallow it. Luckily for us, the inside of our hollow cavities is also lined with epithelia and a lot of this epithelia releases mucus like in the respiratory tract. Now what mucus does is it captures or traps these pathogens. Traps pathogens. And that's the mucus. And if we're talking respiratory tract, the cilia, which are the little hair-like things that are on the ends of the pseudostratified columnar epithelia, it pushes the mucus up. Pushes up, up, up. So it goes up, 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 up the trachea into our pharynx and we swallow it into the stomach. Now why into the stomach? Now sometimes we cough it out, but if we swallow it into the stomach, the stomach has a pH. The stomach has a pH of between one to three. And what this will do is it will denature, which means it breaks down this pathogen so it doesn't harm us. So as you can see, skin and mucus being our first line of defense is a really good way of stopping anything as the first port of call, okay? Now in addition to skin and mucus, because sometimes what can happen is these pathogens can move past our skin, maybe through breaks in our skin, for example. It can move, move past the mucus and it can get into the cells of our body or between the cells of our body or within the blood of our body. Now, if this happens, we still have this innate non-specific response before we move to this adaptive response. So let's have a look at what this response now is. This is now internal defenses, still non-specific. Now there's different types of internal defenses that we have. So for example, we have cells, certain types of cells that can help protect us. We have chemicals, And we have physiological response. Again, none of these are adaptive. None of these are acting as though they know what this pathogen is. They don't know whether it's a virus or a bacteria. They are just doing what they do all the time if any pathogen comes in. Let's first look at what the cellular response is inside the body that's non-specific. So the first type of cellular response we get are phagocytes. Phagocytes. Now, one type of phagocyte is that of the macrophage. Now you can see that phage or phage, which sits at the beginning of phagocyte and at the end of macrophage, means to eat. Phage means to eat. So a phagocytic is just a cell that eats and a macrophage is a large cell that eats. And basically what these cells do is they ingest pathogens. So if it's a bacteria, for example, let's just say I've got a bacteria here. We've got a bacteria that's invaded our body. Now, what we know is that bacteria and viruses, they have proteins. And remember last week when I spoke to you, I spoke to you about uh, blood typing. And I told you that your red blood cells, your erythrocytes, have flags called antigens on them. And what these flags do is tell you whether you're A, B, or A, B, or O. Similar, right? Bacteria have flags to say what it is. Now, the great thing is our body can recognize whether these flags or protein antigens belong to us or are foreign. And that's perfect because when we can recognize this, we can call in the adaptive system. 
and they can fight it off and they can create immunological memory to the flags. That's actually how we create antibodies and sometimes lifelong memory against particular diseases is because we recognize those flags. So if a bacteria comes into the body, macrophages like phagocytes for example, or, uh, phagocytes like macrophages, what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll engulf. They'll engulf that particular bacteria for example and what will end up happening is this macrophage will present some of the flags on its surface. And this is important because when the macrophage has some of those flags on its surface, it can then call in the adaptive immune system, T cells, B cells, and then create an immunological memory. So it's now what we call, if it takes those antigens and presents it, the macrophage becomes an antigen presenting cell. Really important. And it's these antigen presenting cells that can get the T cells and the B cells to produce some sort of memory okay so that's super important so again if there's any questions you just let me know the next type of cell that you need to know are the NK cells known as natural killer cells so they've got a great name natural killer cells NK cells Now what natural killer cells do is it, pretty much what it sounds like, it just kills that pathogen. But it does it through a process known as apoptosis. Apoptosis, if you watched the lecture, I would have told you, I think I would have told you that apoptosis is a Latin term or maybe Greek term for when the uh, leaves fall off the trees in autumn. Beautiful name. Basically, it's a programmed cell death because when the leaves fall off the trees in autumn, it's programmed. It happens every season and it looks like the trees are dying. Apoptosis is programming a cell to die. And that's what NK cells do. They find the pathogen, which may be a bacteria, for example, and they program it to undergo apoptosis. Now, apoptosis is a very specific type of cell death. It's different to necrosis. So you always think necrosis, cell death, apoptosis, cell death. What's the difference? The mechanisms by which they die are very different. In apoptosis, what you find is the cell, all the intracellular compartments and organelles and so forth, they slowly degrade. So the cell wall remains intact, but all the intracellular components degrade until they're basically nothing. Now this is important because in other types of death, like necrosis, the cell can swell and burst and release its products in necrosis. And if it releases its products, this can lead to further inflammatory or immune-based issues, right? So it can cause disease. So in apoptosis, we kill it from the inside. And that's what these NK cells do. Any questions? Nope, cool, all right. So they're the two cells that I need you to know. When we look at chemicals, again, non-specific, chemical responses can include what's called the complement system. Also known as complement proteins. Now there's around about 30 of these complement proteins. They're all, I think most of them at least, are produced in the liver. If you ever get asked a question about a specific protein, and the question ever asks you where is it produced, and you don't know, guess the liver. Most of them are. All right, so complement proteins. What they do is this. Now there's many different types. I don't need you to know the complement pathways. There's three major complement pathways, right? There's a classical pathway, an alternate pathway, an electin pathway, and all three converge. I don't need you to know them. What I need you to know is what happens when they converge is basically Complement proteins, it's in the name, they complement all the other immune responses. They support them, they call upon them. So complement proteins promote what I'm going to talk about here, which is inflammation. They promote fever. They promote these cells, phagocytes, macrophages, natural killer cells. They promote all these processes. That's what these complement proteins do. Now, there's other proteins within the body which are similar to complement proteins that also promote or support immune function. And these are called cytokines. 
And there's a couple of different types of cytokines like interferon, interleukin, tumor necrosis factor. These are all cytokines and what these cytokines do is very similar to complement proteins. They boost, I shouldn't say the word boost, I don't like using the term boost the immune system. What they do is they support the immune system. Now, while the complement proteins really like to focus on these sort of non-specific promotion of the immune system, many of the cytokines, while they do do this, they also promote a lot of the adaptive immune functions and they promote things like T and B cells coming along to help agglutinate, uh, surround and destroy some of these pathogens. So these are chemicals, proteins predominantly within the body non-specific that support this function. Uh, in apoptosis, what happens to the cell once it dies? Oh, that's a great question. Once it dies, all the components get recycled. So some will just degrade until it's nothing, and things like lysosomes and peroxisomes will come along and they'll destroy it until it's basically non-existent. But a lot of the time, a lot of the components, because cells are cells are cells, right? They're made up of fatty acids, they're made up of proteins, they're made up of nucleic acids. We take them and we recycle them. We either get rid of them, urination, um, uh, defecation, or we recycle them. So hopefully that helps, Cindy. All right, now let's look at the physiological response. The physiological response are two things. It's inflammation and fever, which are two important concepts, especially, leading, especially as a nurse, right? Inflammation, we've all experienced inflammation and we've all likely experienced fever. And it might be worth us having a bit of a chat today about what's happening with the COVID-19 situation in regards to some of the immune responses, just to help you out. So, firstly, let's look at inflammation. Inflammation is part of the innate immune system. It's non-specific. So, inflammation occurs any time there's damage to vascularized tissue, all right? So, if there is tissue of the body that has no blood supply and it's damaged, you're probably not going to get inflammation. Now, you're probably thinking, well, what tissue doesn't have blood vessels or is vascularized? And a lot of that, cartilage. Damage to cartilage is very hard to fix because the inflammatory process often doesn't occur there. Now, that's not necessarily true because there's vascularized tissue in the periphery of it and it can lead to tissues having these chemicals and substances from the inflammatory process sort of diffuse through to the cartilage. But a lot of the time, it doesn't necessarily happen in cartilage. All right, this is what happens in inflammation. This is what you need to know. This is what you need to know for the future. Is it common to have inflammation after surgery? Good question, Sabella. Uh, inflammation will happen any time there's damage to vascularized tissue. So for example, if you go in for surgery and they've had to cut through right, some portion of your skin or body, that's damage to vascularized tissue. So inflammation is a normal response to occur. What they usually do is they give you anti-inflammatory drugs. And I'll talk about those in a sec. And what they should do is, at least in part, quash some of the cardinal signs of inflammation, right? Let's write these down. There's four cardinal signs of inflammation, four signs of inflammation that you've all seen, you've all experienced, right? These are the four cardinal signs. Four signs of inflammation. These are redness, pain, heat, and swelling. All right? So we used to, I used to have to remember the Latin names of these. I don't know if I, redness is rubor. Pain is dolor, heat is calor, and swelling is tumor. That's right, because tumor is simply the Latin term or Greek term for swelling. So now the reason why they've got all these old Latin terms, rubo, dolor, calor, tumor, is because these four signs of inflammation have been recognized for thousands of years. The Greeks recognize these basic four signs of inflammation, and they always happen when you have an inflammatory process. Is loss of function another? Jay, brilliant. Yes, loss of function is a more recent addition. It's, it's the fifth sign. And I don't know what the Latin term, it's something like uh, func functional, I don't know. I'm making something up if I say something there. 
Um, I remember reading something in a textbook. Yeah, Jade, 100%. Loss of function is the fifth sign. All right. So let's talk about how these four or five signs come about through inflammation. So this is what happens. If you have a blood vessel, specifically a capillary bed, you know that basically when your heart pumps, right, your heart contracts, pushes blood out of the aorta. The aorta is a large artery. Now in the aorta, you're going to have blood which contains oxygen and nutrients. All right, it's pumping that blood through arteries and the arteries get smaller. They branch more, but they get smaller. As they get smaller, they turn into arterioles. As those arterioles get smaller, they branch more and they turn into capillaries. Now capillaries have holes in them. And this is a capillary bed, right? These capillary beds have holes in them and the holes are there because it's at the capillaries. So arteries, fluid doesn't come out, gases don't come out, nutrients don't come out. At arterioles, nothing comes out, but at capillaries, the blood that moves through begins to leak out. Now, what specifically leaks out at capillaries are things like oxygen and nutrients. Oxygen and nutrients. The reason why is because it's at capillary beds where we have cells that we want to feed. These are the tissues of our body. Right? So we want to give it oxygen nutrients. Now, as the blood continues through, it turns into the venous system, right? Venules, veins, and then that goes back to the heart. And as it goes back to the heart, it's low on oxygen, low on nutrients, so it needs to get oxygen, it needs to get nutrients, and so forth. All right, so we're at the capillary bed. We haven't spoken about inflammation, we need to start doing it. It's damage to vascularized tissue. This is tissue, here's the blood vessel. So this is vascularized tissue. Let's just say something happens, you cut yourself, you damage that tissue. So you step on a needle, you step on a nail, you step on something, right? Something that cuts your skin. You've damaged these cells. When you damage these cells, they start to release important chemicals. Now, there's a lot of cells present under your skin and in your skin called mast cells. So let's just say this is a mast cell. This is probably another cell that you could add to this non-specific list. Let's add it. Mast cell. Right? And what happens when you damage these cells and these mast cells is they start to release chemicals. Now, there's a whole bunch of these chemicals, but there's two you need to know. Histamine and prostaglandins. Histamine and prostaglandins. What histamine and prostaglandins do is something really important. Histamine and prostaglandins, they tell the blood vessel to dilate. Histamine and prostaglandins tell the blood vessel to dilate. Now think about this. If this blood vessel dilates, If this blood vessel dilates, what does that mean? Anyone have any idea? If you dilate a blood vessel, remember blood's coming in. What does that mean? If it's dilated, what do you think is going to be the response? What do you think is going to happen? Any ideas? It's dilated, swelling. So swelling in what way? Before swelling. If you dilate a blood vessel, does more or less blood come in? What do you think? Uh, increased movement of O2 and nutrients. Yeah, yep, increased fluid. Yes, exactly. It's exactly what's gonna happen. You, histamine and prostaglandins dilate the blood vessel, so more blood goes to that area. More blood moves to that area. That's the first thing that histamine and prostaglandins do. Second thing histamine and prostaglandins do is they widen these holes in the capillary beds. They widen those holes in the capillary beds. Now usually, like I said to you before, it's just oxygen and nutrients that leave. The holes in the capillary beds are too small for proteins and cells to leave. Now what are the cells? Red blood cells, white blood cells, right? But now histamine and prostaglandins have widened the gaps in the capillary beds. So now everything leaks out. 
So it's not just oxygen and nutrients that are leaking out, it's cells and proteins, including immune cells. So the reason why this is important is because the immune cells that are leaking out are going to identify if you've damaged this tissue and there's any bacteria that are present. The phagocytes that are present are going to gobble it up and ingest it and present the antigen. All right? There's going to be T and B cells floating through. They're going to play their role. Now remember this, right? I told you last week, I introduced it to you last week, but I'm going to talk about it again. Your leukocytes, which are your white blood cells, there's five types. And I told you to remember them by saying, never let monkeys eat bananas, right? These are the five types of white blood cells. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Great thing is, I don't expect you to know anything about the last two this trimester, but we're going to talk about the first three. All right, what happens is, when you have inflammation, the first leukocytes that come through are the neutrophils and the monocytes. The very first one are the neutrophils. Number one, they're the first that come in with inflammation. And what neutrophils do is they basically play this similar role as these macrophages. They start to gobble up any pathogens that are present. Monocytes are the second to come through. They come in a day or two later. So now you've got monocytes. And this is the thing, monocytes have big intravascular, uh, intracellular uh, nuclei. And what happens is when the monocyte comes through and comes out, as soon as the monocyte leaves the blood vessel, it turns into a macrophage. Right? So it starts to gobble things up too. Over a couple of days, the neutrophils and the monocytes, or now macrophages, begin to die. They've gobbled up all the pathogens, they've brought them in, they've inactivated them so they don't make you sick, and what now starts to accumulate at the site of damage is pus. Pus are dead white blood cells. Specifically pus is dead neutrophils and dead monocytes. Okay, That's what's happening here for pus. Lymphocytes, which we're going to talk about soon, is part of this adaptive system. Lymphocytes are T and B cells. All right? I'm going to talk about that process shortly. But firstly, I want to talk about what happens when these macrophages present with the antigen. Because right? think about it. Oh, no, before I do that, let's talk about how we get these particular things. Right? All right. Let's start with redness. When you get inflammation, the site becomes red. Why? Because more blood has moved to that area. Those blood vessels dilate, so there's more blood in that area. Redness. You get pain because the fluid that leaks out puts pressure on nerves that are present, right? And these nerves are pain receptors, so you get pain. In addition to that, prostaglandin stimulates. It's like a neurotransmitter. It's a chemical that stimulates pain receptors too. So there's double tick for pain. The pressure is causing nociceptive pain and the prostaglandins are stimulating it, causing another nociceptive type of chemical pain. Heat. It becomes hot in that area because more blood is getting to that area. Blood is 38 degrees like we said last week, so it gets hot. Swelling occurs because fluid has leaked out and it's now sitting between the tissues. So the site begins to swell. Tick. And you get a loss of function and the loss of function is because of the swelling. So when that area becomes swollen, you begin to lose function. Does that make sense to everybody? Why we get those four to five cardinal signs of inflammation? Because histamine and prostaglandins as the two main chemicals dilate blood vessels and make it more permeable. Increases vascular permeability. That's what it does. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, now what I want to talk about is when we have all this fluid. So when you think about it, blood vessel. Let's talk about there's no inflammation, right? Because it's important. There's no inflammation. And we want to feed these tissues out here. All right. No inflammation. As the blood comes past, plasma leaks out and oxygen and nutrients leaks out. Great. But there's also fluid, right? The 
fluid go leaves the blood. The cells, like the red blood cells and the proteins, they all remain inside because they're too big to leave. But oxygen, nutrients and fluid leaks out. Now, we have, as a male, five to six litres of blood in my body. Five to six litres of fluid. A good percentage of this fluid is leaving now. Now, we need to reclaim that. I need to keep that five to six litres of fluid in my blood. So we need to pull it back in. The great thing is, because there's proteins and cells inside the fluid, there's an osmotic gradient, osmotic pressure. Water gets pulled towards, or fluid gets pulled towards areas of high concentrations of stuff. So the great thing about keeping proteins and cells in the blood is it pulls the fluid back in and it reclaims the blood fluid. That's what the proteins and cells do. Perfect. But when you have, hopefully that makes sense. If that doesn't make sense, you let me know, please. But when we have inflammation and the, and the blood vessel becomes more, more permeable, what ends up happening is the red blood cells and the white blood cells and the proteins, they're all now out here. Right? So how do we reclaim this fluid? That's why the fluid comes out and swells. But we need to reclaim the fluid. Yeah, if the camera's out of focus, make sure you just click out, click back in. Because I think it should be okay. Is, is everything okay for most people? Just let me know. All good now? Okay, great. All right, so if we've got these big gaps and the fluid's leaking out, we need to find a way of pulling it back in. All right. We can't pull it back into the blood vessel straight away because we don't have the proteins, we don't have the osmotic gradient to pull it in. So what happens is this, all the fluid that's floating between the cells called the interstitium gets reclaimed by our lymphatic system, our lymph. Now tell me if you can't see the color green. We have these blind ended vessels called lymphatic vessels. And what they do is they reclaim the fluid. Now again, we're not, let's, let's just say we're not talking inflammation and we're saying that not all the fluid's being reclaimed, right? Jumps into the lymph. Lymph chucks it back into the blood, goes to the subclavian vein, throws it back into the blood, right? Now there is inflammation. Heaps of fluid. This fluid jumps into the lymphatic vessels. All right. This can be happening anywhere, right? Anywhere that inflammation is occurring. But remember I said, we're gonna have those neutrophils and those monocytes, basically macro, uh, phagocytic cells that are here, and they've gobbled up some bacteria, and they're presenting some of those antigens on their surface. So I've got a macrophage here, and it's presenting some bacterial antigens on its surface. It jumps into the lymphatic vessel and gets carried with the lymph which is the lymphatic fluid. Now, we're gonna, this is now my segue to talk about lymph and lymphatic fluid before we move on to the adaptive system because it's entwined. In the, lymph, in the lymphatic fluid, right, in, in our lymphatic system, we've got all these vessels, right? We know we've got um, arteries and veins, but we've also got lymphatic vessels. Now these lymphatic vessels reclaim that lost fluid. But lymphatic vessels and the lymph system play three roles that I want to talk about, right? So lymph, or the lymphatic system, play three roles, right? The first one is what we've just stated. It reclaims lost fluid. The second role it plays is it's actually the main site where fat gets absorbed. So usually glucose gets absorbed into the bloodstream, right? So that's part of carbohydrates. Amino acids absorbed into the bloodstream, but fatty acids, well, they get absorbed into the lymph. So that's its second function. Its third function, which is gonna be its role today, is an immune function. Now, what we've just spoken about is that we've got macrophages in this fluid that it's just reclaimed, but it's gonna play a role with this 
immune function, which we need to talk about. Uh, what if you had vasculitis, as there is inflammation of blood vessels? Is it because macrophages? I guess it's not working. Yeah, so you can have inflammation of any tissue, including the blood vessels themselves, because they're made up of epithelial cells called endothelium, and they can become inflamed. It just means that what happens is that the blood vessel itself gets inflamed, but you still get the same signs of inflammation, right? The redness, pain, heat, swelling, and so forth. All right. So what happens is that lymph fluid can gather and it, gets, and it drains into particular areas. Now before it drains into the bloodstream, it goes through what we call lymph nodes or lymphatic tissue. All right, lymphatic tissue. Lymph is there, it's got the name lymph because it houses lymphocytes. So lymph because it houses lymphocytes. Now it's not the site of lymph, lymphocyte production, it just houses lymphocytes. Now lymphocytes, like I said to you earlier, are T and B cells. Right? So lymphatic structures house T and B cells. Now you've got primary and secondary lymphatic structures. Primary lymphatic structures, T stands for thymus. B stands for bone marrow. These are primary lymphatic structures. These are the sites of, so thymus is the site of T cell maturation. Bone marrow is the site of B cell maturation. In actual fact, bone marrow is a site of T and B cell production, but bone marrow is B cell maturation, T, T cell maturation. Then from there, T and B cells have a population within secondary structures. So they don't mature in these secondary structures. It's the thymus and bone marrow where they mature. The question might be, where's the thymus? So you know you get your thyroid hugging your trachea. Your thymus is below that, just above the heart at the sternal region, okay? The mediastinum, just up here, all right? Now, secondary structures include things like lymph nodes, tonsils, pyres patches, appendix. These are some secondary lymphatic structures. Now, tonsils and pyres patches are often termed MALT. And MALT stands for Mucosal Associated Lymphatic Tissue. Mucosal associated lymphatic tissue, M-A-L-T. And basically it's the tonsil, but any place that's got mucus, mucosa, right, epithelium that secretes mucus, that's your intestines, that's the back of your throat. So you've got your tonsils at the back of your throat, you know there's different types of tonsils that we have, and you've got pies patches. They're in your intestines, small intestines. The appendix, the beginning of the large intestines, right? I'll write that down. Pies patches is small intestines. Appendix is the start of the large intestines. But again, their role, right, is that they house, and that includes the lymph nodes, they house T and B cells, which means they play a role in responding to pathogens that have been presented by macrophages. So if you've got some sort of bacteria or virus floating through your body that's not in these original areas between the tissues, and they've been reclaimed by lymph, They've been pulled from the blood into the lymph. So if it's in the blood, it'll ultimately get into the lymph. When it's in the lymph, depending on where it is, it goes through these things. If it's at the back of the throat, tonsils. If it's in the neck region or the armpit region or the inguinal region, lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are in various regions, right? You've got cervical lymph nodes, which is in the neck, right? Remember when you get sick, you have a sore throat, you can, you say, oh, my glands are swollen. You're just feeling your lymph nodes. They're not glands, right? Cervical. Um, axillary, which is under the arms, and inguinal. They're the major regions of lymph nodes, okay? And like I said, tonsils, back of the throat, pies, patches, small intestines, appendix, large intestines. Oh, thank you, Jade. Spleen. I forgot about the spleen. So the spleen is a very important secondary structure too.
It's very important. Thank you, Jade. Totally forgot. So what the spleen does, while these will respond to bacteria that's jumped through, blood, uh, through the blood and the lymphatic system, the spleen's going to be directly associated with the blood. So if there's a bacterial infection in the blood, it's going to be going through the spleen. Now, the thing that they all have in common is they all have a lot of connective tissue. And we know connective tissue is cells, gels, and fibers. The cells are going to be immune cells, predominantly. The gels, don't worry about it, it's just fluid, basically. Don't stress. But the fibers are important here, and they're reticular fibers. So they're fine fibers, they form a meshwork. And it's this meshwork, like cotton wool, that traps part Particles moving through. That's what's so important. When the, this lymph fluid moves through with any invading pathogens or macrophages that are holding the antigens, they get caught up in this connective tissue in these particular areas. And then they get activated by stimulating T and B cells. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to use the example of lymph nodes to highlight how this whole process occurs. <clears throat> If there's any questions, let me know. Let's have a quick drink. Oh, I thought the appendix is a vestigial structure. People say that, but it's not. Vestigial is a term that's used as a, an evolutionary leftover, but it's not. The appendix plays a big role, it plays a big immune role, and the appendix plays a role. If you tend to have some issue like uh, diarrhea due to infection, and you end up releasing a whole bunch of your gut flora through diarrhea, right? You need to repopulate your gut flora, and that's what the appendix does. The appendix houses huge amounts of gut flora and bacteria. And so that's so it plays two roles, an immune role, and it also plays a repopulation of gut flora role. You can live without it. So they're, they're necessary, but they're not required, if that makes sense. Uh, what happens when you get appendix and tonsils removed? Does that affect immune function? Uh, to a small degree, yeah, it can. So it can increase the likelihood of infection occurring. So it increases the amount. Of, so here's the thing. Everything's a fine balance, right? So if you have bacterial infections and it gets caught in the tonsils and it's destroying them, breaking them down, but it's not cleared away, then that can get inflamed because that can cause damage to the cells and damage to cells that are blood vessels cause inflammation and inflammation over a long period of time is not good. So again, it's a fine balance. So tonsils are great, but if they constantly get inflamed because they're not being cleared, then they can be detrimental. Removing them stops that. And what the plan would be is that, again, it's, it's a line of defense. There's other lines of defense. So it's not gonna be some, like a make or break for you getting extremely sick because there's gonna be other mechanisms, swallowing it into your stomach, first line of defense, other sorts of uh, lymphoid tissue, right? Which could include the malts and so forth. So it's not a big, big deal. You can easily live without those. Okay. And the threat of constant reinfection of those tissues, especially the appendix, it's, the risk is too high. If you have appendicitis, you've got to take it out. Because if the appendix can burst, right, if it becomes too inflamed, it can burst and it bursts into the peritoneum, which should be, should be an environment that's clear of any bacteria, right? But it explodes all that bacteria that's present in the appendix and causes infection and inflammation in the peritoneum, and that's very bad. An infection in the peritoneum, uh, not good, not good at all. All right, so let's talk about what happens at the lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are these bean-shaped structures. They've got the lymph fluid coming in through various vessels, right? And they've got a little capsule. So they've got this outer capsule that you can see here, right? Now this outer capsule is where the lymph fluid originally starts to move around and shift through. But what you find is that there's these individual little nodule-like areas. Now it's these areas that are important. Because the lymph node is made up of that reticular tissue, the fluid that's floating through this capsule area leaks into these areas. And these areas has Three different types of cells you need to know, all right? On the outside, it's housing B cells. 
So these are B cells. Now what did I say about B cells? B cells are produced in the bone marrow and they mature in the bone marrow. But I haven't told you what they do yet. Here, they're both part of the adaptive immune system, which we're yet to discuss, but we're starting to discuss it here. And then in the middle, what we have are macrophages. And dendritic cells. Okay, let's label them. Macrophage, and dendritic cell. Okay, this is what happens. So, as this fluid floats through, let's say it's happening from an inflamed area, right? Tissue that has inflammation. Looks like I froze for a little bit. Hopefully I'm all good. Can everyone still see me? Just let me know if you can hear me and see me. Okay, sorry. All right, so what we've got is, we've got all this fluid that's coming through from an area of inflammation. This area may contain bacteria still. Right, this fluid may contain bacteria. Or it may contain, fix now, perfect. Or it may contain some of those macrophages Right, neutrophils, monocytes that are presenting the antigen. These bacteria will have the antigen, so maybe a bit of the bacteria didn't, maybe not all of that bacteria got destroyed at the site of inflammation, but some did. So you've got both bacteria and some macrophages coming in with those antigens. Now, as they come in, this is what happens. The macrophages present inside the lymph nodes attack and destroy, just like this one did. So now we've got an accumulation of all these macrophages and they're holding on, they've engulfed that bacteria or virus, they've engulfed it and they've popped off that flag, that antigen, and they're waving it. So we're waving all those antigens here in the middle. Why? Why do we have this? What's the point of waving these antigens? Okay, when we have, like I said earlier, when we have a macrophage that's holding that antigen, what this does is that antigen is a flag to call in T cells. So the T cells see that antigen, that flag. And what the T cells do is a couple of things. One, it creates a memory. Two, is it calls B cells. And what now happens is it calls B cells in And the B cells witness that anti antigen and they do something special. B cells turn into something called plasma cells. And plasma cells create antibodies. So antibodies, there's many different types, IgG, IgE, IgA, right? Antibodies, now what antibodies do uh, one of my quiz questions was, what is an innate barrier? I took skin and I got it wrong. Well, send me an email and I'll have a look for you because skin is definitely an innate barrier. All right, so let me just reiterate this point. And this is what you need to know about T and B cells, okay? It's not just happening at lymph nodes, it's happening at other lymphatic tissues, all right? So, a bacteria has come in, it's got its proteins, antigens. Or a macrophage has come in that's already engulfed a bacteria presenting an antigen. Regardless, the macrophages here in the lymph nodes will end up engulfing the pathogen and waving the antigen flag. This calls in the T cells. And remember, the T cells are here. So it calls in the T cells and the T cells recognize it. They start to create a memory. So these T cells end up these populations get bigger and bigger and bigger. The cells grow, 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 grow because it's making more T cells, right? The T cells call in the B cells and the B cells now recognize this and they make a memory, which means in addition to that, the B cell population grow and divide, grow and divide, grow and divide. Bigger, 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 bigger. B cells, when they want to create antibodies, they don't create them directly. B cells turn into plasma cells and plasma cells create antibodies. Does the macrophage signal T helper cells or just all T cells? T helper cells. At the moment, 
It's, too, it's, it's a lot of information to go through the T helper cells, the cytotoxic T cells, and all the various C, uh, B cells. This is what I want you to remember, because this is the most important concept when it comes to T and B cells. This is what I want you to know. So, B cells make antibodies, but they don't make them directly. B cells must turn into plasma cells, and it's the plasma cells that make antibodies. And it's the antibodies that have memory. So, T cells can have memory, which means, now this is what all this means, the reason why all this happens is so that there is a memory of this nasty bacteria because if we get reinfected, we don't want to have to go through the whole process of getting sick and trying to fight it off. Having inflammation, having a fever, which I haven't spoken about yet, but I will. Having inflammation, having fever, going through all this. What it means is, as soon as that bacteria gets into our body, the T cells that now have a memory will bind to it, and the antibodies that have a memory will bind to it, and they'll destroy it straight away. That's exactly how this works, all right? Antibodies with their memory. What this is called is antibody-mediated immunity. Antibody-mediated immunity, and there's different types. Now, you can have antibody-mediated immunity that lasts for years. You can actually have antibody-mediated immunity that lasts your whole life. Or you can have antibody-mediated immunity that only lasts a couple of weeks or a couple of months or maybe a handful of years. Sometimes, we just don't know sometimes. This is the issue that's happening with COVID-19. So with COVID-19, it's a virus, right? Now viruses have antigens and when it infects the cells of our respiratory tract, our macrophages engulf it, digest it, wave the flag, this whole process happens, we have an immunological response and we have antibodies that have developed memory. So somebody who's had COVID-19, you can take their blood and look at the antibodies floating through. If they've got antibodies specific to COVID-19 antigens, it might indicate they have an immunity, but it's not 100%. And the reason why is the same reason why we can get a cold and then the next year get another cold. I can check your blood if you've had a cold and you'll have antibodies for that particular cold. But the thing is, some viruses mutate really quickly, which means their antigens change. And if the antigens change, these antibodies don't work very well. Then this may happen with COVID-19, we're not sure. We need to know whether the antibodies that we get after being infected remain in the body for years or maybe just for weeks. We don't know. Yes, exactly, Jade. It's because of mutation. So mutation is simply a way of the virus of changing itself so that it can avoid these antibodies next time. All right, so let's now quickly talk about, so I want to talk about antibody-mediated immunity. Then we can finalize with fever. And then after we do that, I can talk a little bit about vaccines and we'll be done. So, any questions, you just pop them through. Is everything making sense? Please say yes or no. And if you say no, ask me a question. What's not making sense? Just pop it on the chat for me. Okay, let's now talk about antibody-mediated immunity. Um, is the dendritic cell memory? So, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Really good point. In the, in the lymph node, those dendritic, I didn't even talk about the, the dendritic cells. Thank you, Georgia. Okay. In that lymph node, the dendritic cells that are there, right? So I, had, I said there's some dendritic cells. What they do is, remember I said that after all that happens, the plasma cells, what happens is those antibodies will get taken up by dendritic cells. Now, dendritic cells stay in the lymph node. T and B cells, they move out, they move around, right? Antibodies, they move out and they move around. Dendritic cells, however, they stay in the lymph node and they hold on to the antibodies. They also hold on to antigens. And they do this to constantly remind the T cells and the B cells of what had happened in the past. It basically says, remember we got invaded by that pathogen, don't ever forget it. So it's constantly priming T cells and B cells. So if it does lose its memory, the dendritic cells will stay there for decades, 
holding on to the antigens and antibodies and basically saying, do not forget. So that's a good point. Thank you, George. I totally forgot about that. All right. Next point is when we look at immune mediated, uh, sorry, antibody mediated immunity. There's different types. So there's different ways of getting anti... So what I just said was one way of getting antibody-mediated immunity, but there's different types. Um, do they die off then when they forget? Yeah, so again, it really depends on the antigen. It depends on the um, type of pathogen that's invading us. So mostly dendritic cells will stay there for many decades, but there's going to be... Some, everyone's different. So it's really hard to make a blank blanket statement in regards to specific diseases and how long the dendritic cell stays with the memory of it, and B and T cells, for example. All right, here are the two types. You can have active and passive antibody-mediated immunity. All right, basically, it's how do you get antibodies to remember a pathogen, right? Active immunity is when it's active. It's an active process, which means your body's doing it. So active antibody-mediated immunity is when your body creates the antibodies itself. You create the antibodies. Right? Passive immunity, you do not create the antibodies, you just receive the antibodies. So create is, the, is what I should underline here. You create the antibodies. In passive immunity, you receive the antibodies from somebody else. All right? So it's a passive process. All right. <clears throat> There's two types of active and passive as well that you need to know. So, first type, natural and artificial. Now, if you watched the lecture, I'm sure, I'm sure of it, that I would have just gone on, I would have banged on about the natural fallacy. It's so important, especially as a clinician. The natural fallacy is the fact that people hear the term natural and they think it's better. They think it's safer. They think it's normal and it's not necessarily the case. Natural does not mean better, especially when it comes to biology, especially when it comes to health. Natural just means there was no other engaging factor involved. No other man-made engaging factor. Artificial just means that. So natural versus artificial, one is not better than the other, all right? Snake venom, that's natural. Poison ivy, that's natural. Arsenic, cyanide, they're all natural, okay? Doesn't mean those things are better. And the th same goes when it comes to compounds that people ingest, all right? Drugs, people think, I don't wanna take a pharmaceutical drug, it's not natural, it's artificial. So they'd rather take something like ginkgo biloba, right? Well, you gotta remember that natural doesn't always mean better. Sometimes natural can be worse than better, all right? But I'm not going to bang on, that was in the lecture. So, what's the difference? What is naturally acquired active immunity? Naturally acquired active immunity. So, if active immunity is you create the antibodies yourself, natural acquired means you basically got the infection and you created the antibodies yourself. So, you created, and I'm going to just write this for antibodies, you created antibodies after infection. Just like the process we just spoke about with the lymph nodes, for example. That's naturally acquired active immunity. You created the antibodies after infection. Artificial acquired active immunity is, again, you created the antibodies, because that's the definition of active, you created the antibodies after, not an infection from the environment, that's what the natural is referring to. You got the flu, for example. So naturally acquired is, you got the flu. You got the flu, you got the viral pathogen, you created antibodies against it. That's naturally acquired active immunity. 
artificially acquired active immunity is you received it in an artificial environment, meaning a vaccine. So you created antibodies after vaccination, which I would much rather prefer than creating antibodies after an infection. There are people out there that say they would rather get an infection and do it naturally than get the vaccination. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous and it doesn't make any sense. Why would you want to get sick and actively put yourself in a worse situation when you can have the exact same outcome and create the antibodies without getting sick? Brilliant. All right, passive immunity. Passively acquired immunity, you receive the antibodies. So you don't have an antigen that you make antibodies against. You just get given the antibodies. Now, what these two scenarios make sense. But what scenarios can you just receive antibodies from the environment? Breast milk. Breast milk is an example where this happens, right? Mum's breast milk contains mum's antibodies. So basically, she's just giving you antibodies in a natural environment. And that's what's happening here. Artificially acquired passive immunity is when you get injected with antibodies. And it's not that common, but basically you get injected with serum, injected with serum containing antibodies. All right? And that can happen for some diseases. So there are some diseases where we don't have vaccinations, but we have to give people serum, for example. All right. So that is antibody-mediated immunity. Let's finish, let me talk about fever. I'll write down the adaptive and then we're basically going to be done and that'll be our hour sorted. Any other questions, let me know. All right, last thing, fever. So what happens with fever is this. Again, non-specific. Cytokines play a role in fever and another chemical called Pyrogens. Pyro means fire. Fever makes you feel like you're on fire, so pyrogens. Uh, we've got a question. If there are antibodies in lymphocyte uh, B cell plasma, can another person compatible blood plasma be given to a person as a transfusion for passive artificial immunity to help them fight a pathogen? Good question. So there was some talk about with the COVID-19 because we don't have a vaccine. So there was some talk that maybe what we could do, and it is feasible, is to take individuals' blood, individuals who have been exposed to COVID-19 and have developed antibodies, take their blood, pull out the antibodies, spin them out. So you don't have to take whole blood. You take whole blood, but you separate the antibodies out. That way, it doesn't matter about the blood type, and you can give those antibodies as serum, as what I said was the artificially acquired passive immunity. And that could provide immunity for a short period because over time those antibodies will disappear because they weren't made from you or by you. So yeah, really good question. Can, can happen, can occur. Doesn't have to happen with compatible blood types because you separate out the antibodies from the blood. Now with fever, what happens is you know about the hypothalamus, right? You know that when you've got the brain, at the bottom of the brain you've got the hypothalamus with those two danglies called the pituitary gland, right? Now the hypothalamus is the master regulator. It sets the body temperature of 37 degrees. So if it's too cold, it makes us shiver. If it's too hot, it makes us sweat, right? But there's a thermostat is set at 37, just like at home. You set your air conditioning unit to a particular temperature. And as the environment changes, it either blows out more cold air or blows out more heat, right? Hypothalamus does the same. So what happens is when you get an infection or a fever, pi pyrogens and cytokines come in and through a process that we don't know it changes the thermostat and pushes it up it may push it up to something like 38 maybe 39 degrees so what happens now is that's the baseline and it thinks everything else is cold right usually 37 degrees the body's at 37 it goes I'm perfect so you don't shiver or you don't feel too hot but what happens is it sets it too high so what happens is you get cold. You think it's, everything's too cold. So you shiver and shiver and shiver, even though it's not cold, but that shivering produces more heat just so it brings the body temperature. But by getting too hot, you feel super hot and that's the fever. Now the reason why your body does this is because a lot of bacteria and viruses, they can't survive at 38 and 39 degrees. That's one thing. 
They can't survive with that. They don't divide. They don't make more copies of themselves. They just don't do it. The other thing is, the higher the body temperature, the faster our enzymes work. So the faster our immune system and enzymes work to destroy and break all these things down. Fever's a hard one because you get the question all the time, is a fever a good thing or a bad thing? Depends, depends on the situation. It's like inflammation, is it good or bad? Inflammation's good short term, bad long term. Fever, if it lasts too long, not good. But fever in the short term is shown to be beneficial, especially for viral diseases. So it's really hard to say, really hard to know whether a fever should be broken or not. Difficult. Uh, um, all right, let's just finish with that adaptive immune system and we'll be done because and we've already spoken about it, right? I already said that the adaptive immune system is made up of two things, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, also known as T cells and B cells. Cool. And what the T cells, they mature in the thymus and B cells mature in the bone marrow. That's why the B and T. So don't forget that. If you ever get asked a question, where are they mature? T, thymus, B, bone marrow, not thyroid. Thyroid produces thyroid hormone, thymus. And like I said, T cells can have memory, B cells can have memory. T cells call in B cells, and B cells can produce plasma cells. And plasma cells produce these antibodies. I draw them like a Y because that's their shape, all right? We're done. I think we've gone through all the really important points. So hopefully that helps. And this is your last tutorial for AMP for trimester one.